September 27, 1918. 8.40 a.m. near the front lines of northern France. Lieutenant Field E. Kindley takes off in his up with Camel, leading the 148th Aero Squadron's A Flight. Below them, British troops, along with some Australians and Americans, are going over the top, leaving their trenches to breach the Germans' heavily fortified Hindenburg Line. Kindley's mission is simple, cause as much damage as possible. The worse the Germans have it, the more Allied soldiers will live through the day. Behind enemy lines, Kindley leads his men in bombing rail transports, then signals them to break formation and begin strafing retreating German troops. An observation balloon appears on the horizon. The balloon is one of Germany's deadliest weapons. In the basket beneath, an observer armed with binoculars calls in artillery strikes on Allied troops. Because the balloon is so important, Kindley knows it will be well protected. Archie, black smoke puffs full of shrapnel from German guns, is so thick that Kindley will describe the sky as a single black cloud. Kindley forces the balloon out of the sky and goes to work on the machine guns holding back the advance. This means going low, and he soon hears enemy lead sporadically ripping through the fabric of his airplane. 9.20 a.m. On his way to the next machine gun nest, he hears a sound that by now in his career is far too familiar. The pop of aerial guns blazing away to his rear. Turning his head, Kindley sees the assailant, a German aircraft with guns fore and aft. The enemy may be more heavily armed, but Kindley knows he can use his camel's superior maneuverability to his advantage. He jinks right and left, slowing the aircraft. Almost instantly, he is behind the enemy, bringing his crosshairs onto the target. Kindley is pleased to see a short burst set fire to the plane. The stop with camel can carry only 30 seconds of ammunition, and that shot has used up his final bullets. Looking up, he sees two German fighters trailing another member of his flight. He knows that the deaths available to a combat pilot are few and unpleasant. With parachutes as yet unheard of, Anyone who finds himself in a burning aircraft must choose to either roast alive or jump to his death. Though out of ammunition, Kindley has seen too many comrades die in these ways already. His decision is made. He pushes to full throttle, charging the Germans who are about to kill his friend. German pilots, too, fear death in the sky. Seeing Kindley inbound, they flee. Field Kindley was born in Pea Ridge, Arkansas on March 13, 1896. His mother would die just two and a half years later. His father, who had been a teacher in Indian Territory, became an educator in the Philippines, and when Kindley was seven, he joined his father there, having spent a few years in the care of his grandmother and Aunt Emma. Though Field stayed in the Philippines until the age of 12, he spent most of his boyhood in Gravit, Arkansas, where he lived with his uncle Bob and Aunt Molly. Bob and Molly's son, Uther, four years his senior, was like a brother to the boy. It would be letters home to Uther that provide the most detailed record of Field's life in the war. The teenage Field would be remembered as a dependable boy, a good conversationalist, and a sharp dresser. He acted in school plays, delivered groceries, and worked as a projectionist in the local theater. An average student, he chose to drop out of high school shortly before he would have graduated. In 1917, when the United States entered what would become the First World War, the nation saw its first draft since the 1860s. 24 million Americans, 98% of males under the age of 46, filled out selective service cards, and millions of them were drafted. By summer 1918, more than 10,000 American troops were arriving in Europe per day. Most were infantry, but a tiny minority took part in a new kind of battle. Though that first 12-second airplane flight had taken place just 15 years earlier, the contraptions were already adapted into military killing machines. With fighter pilots romanticized as knights of the sky, the air war was largely the purview of upper-class college graduates. For the United States' part, the Air Corps was dominated by members of the Ivy League. Yet it was into this club that farm-bred high school dropout Field E. Kindley enlisted. While other pilots with similar backgrounds proved unpopular or became loners, Field excelled, becoming not only accepted but developing into a trusted commander. Historian and Air Force veteran Jack Ballard attributes this not only to Kindley's skill as a pilot, but to what he calls his unassuming and Arkansas-friendly personality. Because America's aerial infrastructure was so new, 
Kindley saw his first combat with Britain's 65th Royal Air Squadron, gaining invaluable experience to train America's 148th Pursuit Squadron. Though Kindley's first combat zone flight was just six months before war's end, he led his squad in 27 battles and made 12 confirmed aerial kills. Most of these were against the Fokker D-7, one of Germany's most feared war machines. After the war ended on November 11, 1918, the New York Times declared Kindley to be, next to Eddie Rickenbacker, America's greatest ace. When Kindley returned to the U.S. in 1919, he was met by a flurry of reporters. Now a famous pilot with two military decorations, the Arkansas farm boy deflected praise, crediting the little-noticed heroes of the air war. I could not make any statements about flying without paying a tribute to the mechanics who worked night and day to enable the flying men to take the air. The life of the pilot is in the hands of his mechanics. In July, Kindley wrote Uther. I am back, and in one sense of the word, I am glad, but would be more satisfied if I only knew what I was going to do in the months to come. Offered a hefty sum to recreate his aerial battles for a film studio, Kindley continued his military career instead. Racing SE-5As for the Army, he worked to keep aircraft before the public eye and rose to the rank of captain. Then, on February 1, 1920, the young Arkansan's career abruptly ended. Preparing an air show for Black Jack Pershing in San Antonio, Kindley went low to warn off enlisted men who had wandered into a live fire area. Tragically, his plane collided with the ground. His skull was fractured in the crash, likely killing him instantly. As his plane burned, cooking off the ammunition payload, servicemen stood waiting to recover the body. Newspapers across the country mourned the fallen ace, none more so than the Gravit Daily Herald, which eulogized him as generous, loving, and brave, adored by his men and fellow officers.